have the commander, U.S. Naval Forces with us, Admiral Sam Paparo. And interesting story, Admiral Paparo is a Top Gun graduate, over 6,000 hours of flying, and what really scares the shit out of me is 1,100 carrier landings. Admiral, welcome. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Dave, did I just lose you? I lost him. Dave, are you back or am I back? Dave, you're muted, I think. There you go. Sorry about that. I somehow or other got kicked off, but thank God we, we, we've learned to deal with that. So our tech is the host and I didn't hang up on you. Okay. So last thing I was saying is that, you know, that, that, that I don't know how you do carrier landings. I, I've heard about those, you know, my dream since I think I was like this tall, was always to ride in a fighter, but not land on a freaking carrier, especially not in the middle of the night in the rough snow. Well, so it's, anyway. been an, it's been an exciting career and uh, it's, you know, it's been an honor and a privilege to fly Navy jets off of aircraft carriers. And it's, it's uh, really just the training that I've gotten for those that went before me that um, enabled all of us to do it safely. But uh, thank you for those words. Now, do you still fly? No, I've not flown in uh, about four years was my last flying duty, uh, but I still dream about it. <laughs> I, I bet it's, it's, I bet that's a hard one to walk away from. And that's, you know, one of the questions that we'll really get into on the, you know, the stigma portion of the suicide prevention, you know, as you know, that is one of the quickest things. If you're a pilot and you're having mental health issues, pretty much DOD says, hey, ground. We're, we're done. And, you know, that's one of the, the real questions that we've come up with over the past is who would we prefer is flying that plane? That same person who's having mental health challenges and not getting help or and just not telling anybody or, you know, a pilot who is actually getting that help. We know your pilots are like special ops and everything. You'll just hide it. That's a simple fact. Flying means enough to you where you hide it. So how do we fix that? How do we fix, you know, special ops, your Navy SEALs? Same thing. Is there a way to fix that? Yeah, I, well, I, I think that, I think that the, the, the tools exist uh, such that uh, the thought that, uh, that grounding oneself for a temporary period of time in order to deal with some mental health issues is a well-established process in the Navy. And uh, it's true that we want, we, we want and we need people that are operating at their absolute best to be operating on aircraft, uh, particularly in the carrier environment where there's so many other lives that depend on that person to be at their absolute best. Uh, but I've known many people that have sought help for mental issues they've seen their flight surgeon, they've gone through the process of counseling, and then they've regained flight status uh, very quickly uh, afterwards. And so I think the first tool that we have in our toolkit as leaders is to model the behavior of telling everybody that it's okay to seek help uh, for mental health issues and to destigmatize it through our own behavior. Uh, so um, I think that the tools are there and I think it's very much incumbent on leaders uh, at every level uh, to, um, to destigmatize that notion of seeking help. But you bring up an interesting point, which is that it, it is an inherent culture of uh, the aviation culture to avoid the docs, you know, because the docs the, uh, the, the healthcare professionals inherently will stop you from flying. Flying is the thing that you love the best. Uh, but, if, but we also teach people uh, to be able to compartmentalize so that when they're in the cockpit, they're 100% focused. And if you lose that ability to compartmentalize and you're having human factors that are interfering with your performance of your duties, it becomes a duty to seek that help. 
And I think another protective factor within this is the principle within aviation that, um, that uh, the, the absolute most highest virtue in aviation is that ability to identify the ways in which you can get better. Mm-hmm. And that's not just Special in all. the uh, flying of the aircraft and the activation of your procedures, but it's also in the extent to which you're taking care of yourself. So, um, I, you know, I recognize that there are cultural barriers to be able to seek, seek that help. And for all of us as leaders, it's incumbent upon us to recognize those cultural barriers and to uh, break those down and then to connect people uh, that are having mental health issues with the ability to seek counseling and seek help uh, to get up and over the hump on that. And um, I'll also note that I believe it's Military One Source actually provides an anonymous means they do. by which you Correct. can do that if you're not able, you know, if, 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 you know, if you, if you're listening to senior leadership and they're talking to you about this, but you still don't believe them, Military One Source is a fantastic resource that I think you get up to 10. I mean, this is off the top of my head, Dave, but I think you get up to like 10 sessions from Military One Source before you exhaust that resource and must seek a more formalized program within the healthcare system. So uh, there's a lot of good tools at our disposal, but the greatest of these is the leadership of the experienced hands in a squadron that can say, hey, I was having an issue with this and I sought some help. I talked to my flight surgeon, my flight surgeon connected me with a counselor we talked our way through this. Uh, I connected myself with cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a therapy that I very much believe in. And I was able to get through these problems and, uh, and regain, regain flight status. And, and so, you know, so, oh, go ahead, go ahead. And so, you know, one of the things that we really, there's also a lot of groups like ours that will help your pilots. We you know we've got a ton of different trainings that we partner with. And I know there, there's a bunch of us out there just for that reason, because if they're that afraid, we want them getting help. That's the goal. All we give a crap about is get better. And so, you know, we'll help. Obviously, we have our limits at how far we can go with that. But, you know, we, we do try to help them. And there's tons of groups out there. I just want to make, make sure people are aware. But you're right. One source is awesome. And at least with the 10 appointments that you can get, it's really enough appointments to understand where you are mentally, that they can really dig into it deep enough. And then at that point, you figure out, hey, you know, we, we've got this under control, we're good. But you're right, beyond that 10, it's time to get something more serious. If you're still struggling after that, we really need to get into a CPT, Cognitive Processing Program, that can really help unwind some of those issues. So yeah, great answer. Thank you, Admiral, for that. Um, the next one, and you kind of t- tipped on this, is how do we ensure a top-down narrative for all service members, you know, starting as you and I talk, all the way back in boot camp, letting them know that, you know, that warrior mentality is awesome, but it's more than just being in shape. It's more than knowing how to fire a weapon, fly a plane. It is that mental aspect. And how do we get them to really accept that? Well, um, the basis of, I think the, the basis of the, of the approach on that is in the discussion that you just met, made, which is it, it begins in either Pensacola, in Annapolis, in Chicago, in, at Great Lakes. It starts at the first source when, you're first, when you first encounter that brave and patriotic volunteer that decides to take the oath and enter into the service is to stress uh, that uh, whole person fitness. And um, we, are, we are now uh, in, within the Navy, we are stressing this notion of total sailor fitness. And that's fitness between the ears as well as our physical bodies um, to help imbue people with that ability to uh, 
build their warrior ethos and to build uh, their strength from the inside out. And um, a part of that, you know, it takes so much greater strength, Dave, to say, I'm having a problem with this. And to, you know, to have the, the, the bravery to say that in front of people to say, I am a human being, I have frailties, just like every one of the 7.2 billion human beings on this earth. And I am having a problem with this and I seek your help. You know, a person is never so strong as they are when they are asking for help, when you make yourself vulnerable in such a way. And uh, it becomes, it becomes uh, contagious in the best way because, uh, you know, when some of the seemingly strongest and fittest in the group make that admission, it makes it easier for everybody else to say the same thing and enables us to help each other and to lift ourselves up. Yeah, you, you, you hit all of our answers right on and you keep quest, you keep answering my next questions before we get to them. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> really... I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. If only you had forwarded them to me, Dave. I, I, did. I actually did. <laughs> but, yeah. sorry. Yeah. You know, I had, actually I had a long chat the other day with the CNO and we were talking about this and some different processes. He was telling me that you guys have actually extended boot camp now to kind of cover resiliency and really get into this a little bit more because one of the things that you know we, we've probably known forever but we i think we've tried to shield ourselves from is the military doesn't cause most of these problems they exist before people get there the military and military service tend to exemplify them a little bit but the problems are there and that's why i think it's so so incredible that you guys have extended that training to be able to fill that need a little bit and help them. Oh. So Dave, yeah, and Dave, this is a reality, but um, about 40% of American youth that graduate high school go on to some kind of higher education, a university education to college or to technical school. But only about 25% have got the qualifications to join the military. It is very competitive to join the military. The, the, the mental acuity required to pass the ASVAB, the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery of Tests, the, uh, the physical capability to meet the entrance standards, the health capability, uh, the clean record, which is not to be dismissed also. And it tells you something about the young people that are joining and many of them, and I've heard the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy speak of this very poignantly, they're either running to something or they're running from, from something. And they're, they're maybe running to a family that they never had, or they're running from a bad family, uh, you know, a, a, a family environment that they want to escape or a place that they want to escape. And they frequently are seeking to become better versions of themselves. And uh, I, I was just in Great Lakes. I was the uh, speaker. Our command had sponsored a boot camp class, and I went to inspect the tr troops and to speak to the, new, the newly minted sailors and their very grateful families. And the first thing I want to say is, is if you have any doubt about the future of our great nation, go to Great Lakes and see the young people that are graduating there. Really? And, uh, and you'll be so inspired by the hope that's in their eyes, by their intelligence. Uh, it, it, is, it is truly inspiring. But that does not negate the fact that many come in with already pre-existing problems uh, and it's just a fact of life that we must deal with. And so we have added two weeks of training in boot camp to build resilience among the recruits. And when, when we talk about resilience, it's kind of a fancy way of saying tough, you know, and resilience is, is the ability to take a punch. Right. And not just the ability to take a punch, but the ability to take a punch and that punch makes you stronger. 
And so um, we have worked very closely with uh, the Navy spec war community to build that into our syllabus, also to include elements of, um, of self-defense uh, as well as, you know, a, a martial arts element, as well as uh, deeper and richer small arms training, which also builds confidence within our, within our troops. And it's very inspiring to see the work that they've done. And I, you know, I had a chance to see each and every recruit I had a discussion with some of them, with their, with many of their families, and walked away so inspired. And uh, and I think part of the effect of this too, Dave, it's kind of the same effect that you get in investing, is early investment produces enormous leverage long range, and uh, and so um, I think the CNO has been quite visionary in implementing this change into, into boot camp. I have to say, I was, you know, one of the greatest parts I think of this, what we're doing with these broadcasts is being able to talk face-to-face -to, -face to you, to the CNO, Secretary of the Army we're working with, you know, and that it's, it's gotta help the people out there to see, even people at, all the way up at your levels are here, boots on the ground, sleeves rolled up, trying to figure out a way. You know, I know my day, which was very similar to your start date. Actually, you were in college when I enlisted. But, you know, if we had a mental problem, <laughs> push through it was the answer for everything. I mean, it didn't matter back then. Yeah, you ate it or you drank it. Yeah, exactly. It, did, it didn't freak it. We, you know, mental problem. What the hell's that? And I love seeing now that we've gone to this more, let's get it resolved. Because it was hard. I mean, I, you know, I... My, my reason personally for going in was to go to Bud's and I broke my foot on my way to Bud's like, it, like, you know, a real hero. Yay. My foot of all things. And I know that really screwed me up losing that aspect. And even when I, you know, when I did say, Hey, you know what, this is a problem for me. It was like tough. You signed up, you enlisted. We didn't promise you you could go there. And I realized that and okay, went on, but you know, that was 50 years ago or 40 years ago. Oh, God, 40 years ago. <laughs> a long time. But, you know, and, and now it's so great to see that you guys are taking such an active effort in not being those, those same leaders anymore. Not that that was wrong for our generation. That's what we needed. But we do have, you know, generation to generation changes. Um, yeah, the, um, I, I will stress this, though, Dave, is that, uh, I, you know, I don't think that this generation is much different than you and I were at that age. I think, uh, you know, in fact, I'm frequently amazed, you know, my own children are going to go through the kind of same schools that I went to, and they seem to be working on much more advanced material than I worked on at that, at that time. I think that all of, I think that uh, in our approach to all of this is that it's, we, we uh, that the Navy has learned over this 30 years, that we didn't have to adjust, we did not have to change the approach because of general generational changes in human beings. The last 30 years did not change the essential nature of the species Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, the, you know, the, the difference is, is that we're smarter and we're better at identifying these problems. And I, I think that we're producing a better sailor. When I visit a squadron and I see the young people that are in the squadron and I compare themselves to that version of myself 35 years ago, when I first entered into the Navy, you know, I, that 35, that, that's, that Sam from 35 years ago pales in comparison to the young people that I see out there serving today. Uh, so I, I, and I, I look askance at people that say, oh, well, this generation, they need so much more. I just think that's nonsense. I think human beings are the same as they have been for the last 10,000 years of civilization. It's just a matter of our own learning as we unlock all of the complexities that is in the wonderful creature of the human being of getting smarter and better about how taking care of ourselves and about how 
how each of us can become that best version of ourselves. And I agree. I don't think better or worse generationally, but we didn't have to put up with all this social media. And, you know, when in our day, we weren't on camera. Every, I don't know how these kids do it today. I mean, everything they do is so exposed. And, you know, I, that would be hard for me. Even It is to this day. I hate the fact Zoom, I think it took me a year and a half before I'd get on a Zoom call. And yeah. these kids are so they're, they're so accustomed to it. And I, I love the fact that they're so open at sharing things. And I think that's going to help them in a big way where we were much more closed. I know my dad was Marine and a police, police officer. And if we'd ever cried, my God, he'd have freaking batted me down like it was yesterday. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love the fact that now it's everything is so open. So, no, I'm not certainly not saying anything. Yeah generationally bad or good, but it's just and awesome. I, I do agree with you that um, our life of constant cameras and, uh, and um, the fascination that, that, that those cameras uh, manifest themselves in with a, fa with a fascination of one's own image and the images that we have of ourselves and then the images that are projected and there's something too about the on about the camera world that detaches us from some of the best parts of being a human being. Correct. Is uh, ninety percent of communication is nonverbal. You get it from nonverbal cues while being with a person. Human beings, when we're with one another, are uh, essentially agreeable, and um, and there's a certain armor that people's anonymity behind their screens confers that connects people with crueler elements of human nature, which is something that we must reckon with. And, uh, and I, I think that, that human beings are a learning species and we will learn to reckon with this. But you know, this notion of walking around constantly with a hand computer and with cameras and all constantly filming and imaging the things that we're doing isn't but 15 years old. And we're, we're still, as a society, making an adjustment to this. You know, and one of the things that there is a downside to it, we saw it, Dr. David Rudd is one of our board members and he's one of the most known suicidologists on the planet. And he was doing a training for, the Marine Corps and uh, suicide prevention. When they got done with the training, the general came up to him and he said, hey, what do you think the problem is? Why are these numbers still going up? And about that time, the I think it was a colonel dismissed all of his people that had been in this training. And within a matter of seconds, every one of them, you see the thumbs start on the phone and they lost communication with each other. And you know they just no longer communicated through verbal and they went to the phones and <laughs> Dr. Rudd looks at the commander and goes, there's your, there's half your problem right there. We've lost that interpersonal skills other than when they're required. And that's, you know, one of the things that we're trying to talk to on the stigma is getting as much as we can back to the more, the more personal communications and limiting, because it is, it, it's weakening when people become so, focused on their phones that they forget to say hi. Mm -hmm. There's no way to see those signs. You cannot see someone's hurting over a phone, as you know. Yeah. And, you know, so that's one of the big things that we're, as an, as an organization, we're really talking to services about is even limiting time on the phones. You guys have it great in the Navy because you're out at sea and they, you know, that forces a lot of the interpersonal communications because they really, you know, in the middle of, well, I can't say I remember. <laughs> we didn't even have a freaking cell phone then. But I'm guessing in the middle of the ocean, Indian Ocean, there's not a whole lot of cell towers. So they're probably we are we do, we are connected though to the global information grid, and wow. uh, and the sailors do have connection with their social media wow. while they're at sea. Yes, <laughs> I would not have guessed that to save my life. Now, uh, now, uh, granted, they're carrying chains and operating on the world's most dangerous work environment, the deck of an aircraft carrier for 12 to 14 hours a day. And, uh, but, uh, we, but we do cultivate access to the, to, uh, to the net for, uh, That's awesome. when, when we're at sea. 
You know, I do have one quick question before we move on from the younger generation. What would you say, and this, we get this question a lot, to the parents of a 17-year-old who, you know, right now people are apprehensive about, because especially with all the, with the suicide rates going up, apprehensive of their kid enlisting. What would you say to those parents to kind of dis, you know, dis, dissuade that fear a little bit? Well, the first I would say is that though our suicide rates are going up, um, uh, uh, I, I believe we still trail the similar demographic in the civilian world. That does not imbue me with any sense of complacency about my absolute commitment to drive the rate of suicidal ideations and to drive the rate of suicides to zero. But a young person that joins the service is going to inherit an important mission uh, something that's greater than themselves. They're going to inherit uh, a camaraderie that's born of having gone through something difficult together and having overcome. They're going to sign up for teamwork and they're going to sign up for uh, what we hope to be as close to a family experience for a sailor as they possibly can and layer upon layer of concerned leadership that has, that has nothing greater in mind for that sailor than their health and well being, which will manifest itself in mission accomplishment for the United States Navy and for the nation. That's what, you know, that's what I would say to a parent of a 17 year old who is joining the service. Um, and I'm the parent of somebody that was 17 that joined the service, um, you know, and so um, um, I, you know, I will, I will say that um, it is, it is a, when I, but when I say that, I, I think what gives us that, that protection that it confers a lower suicide rates among sailors than their um, peer demographic in the civilian world, that protective measure is uh, the mission, the satisfaction, the camaraderie, the care, the leadership are those elements that confer that, uh, that uh, protection. And then the last thing that I would say to that parent is that, uh, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, I'm going to look after your young person with the same sense of duty that I look after my own children. Kind of what I figured. That's kind of what I figured you th that that would come. And I agree. I to me the the most the best thing I got out of my time in the service, and I mean this in a non-binary way, is the brotherhood. Mm -hmm. I still talk to half of my half the people I served with, and it's been I got out in 1987, and I you know we're still we talk regularly. Um, initially, before I went through my the rash of suicides that got me in this world, you know, we had eight of us that were now we, we vacationed together and we did it all. And, you know, when we started losing them, you know, you're talking about admitting where you go. We lost four of our eight within about 18 months. Uh, David, I'm sorry. And, you know, I, I uh, if not for a misfire, I was number five. I was so angry that how could I miss this with guys I talked to every freaking day that I'd known for 20 years. And, you know, that was a hard thing for me. And it really, you know, that was kind of step one to getting into all this. And then a couple other things happened over the years. But, you know, one thing I will say is you're right. It, it, the the camaraderie we get will last a lifetime. And you got to lean on that to, to get through hard times. Okay, um, that's awesome. Now, one of the things that we're really trying to get going is, you know, and I'm sure you're familiar with ASSIST and all the different programs out there for suicide prevention. And we're really trying to get away and go into a more peer-based training system. We want to get as many of your NCOs and, you know, the, the junior officers trained in peer training rather than the ASSIST because the peer training does two things, which makes it really awesome. 
And number one is it teaches you how to help your buddy. I mean, it really does. And it teaches you to understand rather than hear the scripted response. And we love that. But I think back to your point of the resilience training in the, in the boot camp is peer training also trains you how to be careful for yourself, which, you know, the suicide prevention, they really don't get in that. So we love those. And we're really working at creating some programs for you guys. Another, another meeting, but it's one, you know, um, I, okay. I, I, I really appreciate that approach. And, um, uh... And I think that this uh, is, I think we sometimes fall into this false illusion that one, one tremendous program will be the one thing that's going to help us get out of this. And then it becomes a boutique. <laughs> and then we as teammates end up abdicating our responsibility as human beings to each other because we say, oh, this program will take care of the problem when, uh, the, when uh, our approaches to this problem must be a comprehensive approach and each and every living soul should, should, have, should have deputized themselves as a suicide prevention officer. We should be eternally vigilant around each other and, and hearing even the slightest offhand remark or behavior that would lead us to have any notion at all that a person is contemplating harming themselves is to stop, find a private place, make yourself vulnerable to the other, and then just engage in a conversation and to be that speed bump that earns them one more day. And, uh, awesome. and so, uh, you know, I, 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 I couldn't agree more with you on this is that our approach to this problem has got to be comprehensive. And um, more often than not, suicide is an impulsive act. Uh, there are occasions where there is a planned process, uh, but more often than not, it's an impulsive act. And if you can be the speed bump on that one day, you can have that essential early leverage, connect that person with the help. And, it, and, uh, and so um, I agree with you. I agree with you more. I don't, know what the, I don't know what the origin of the term one more day is, but I drew the inference. Mm -hmm. That is, let's, you know, like if you don't think that you can go on, ask yourself if you can go on for one more day. And one more day becomes a week and a month and a lifetime. And I will give you the, the whole reason that it came about was, you know, after I started to, after I decided to take, do something, I noticed that there were all these groups doing suicide prevention, yet numbers climbed every year. So I wanted to figure out what they were doing wrong. So I started talking to survivors, my own team survivors that, you know, had died. And every one of them said the same thing. Hey, there were no signs. But if I had one more day, I would have fought it. I would have been able to intervene. So that's where it came from. But the funniest thing is, I mean, literally the first 10 families said there was no signs. So I remember after the 10th, I'm coming back. I'm in, sitting in an airport. I'm in a bar having a drink while I'm waiting for my flight. And I got this brochure or this flyer up on suicide prevention. And the guy sitting next to me looks over. He says, oh, do you do suicide prevention? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, I'm a psychiatrist with a, with a subspecialty in suicide prevention. So I'm telling him this story about how frustrated I am that all these 10, I'm looking for this, you know, golden ticket answer to why suicides happen. And I said, you know, all 10 of the families said that there were no signs. And this guy starts laughing, almost falls off his bar stool, laughing so freaking hard. And he said, Dave, not one of them didn't have a sign. So he writes down these 10 questions. He says, I want you to go back to these same families and just ask him these questions. I guarantee at least half of them will check half the, half the questions. And there's things like drinking more, withdrawing from family, the, you know, the typical signs. And I remember it was, it, it was almost an aha moment for each family where they realized, oh, my God, there were multiple signs. We just didn't know. We didn't know there were signs. We didn't know when there's one of them. It's just a flag to maybe take an eye, watch a little carefully. When we get to three, four, then we need to intervene. And so, you know, that's how one more day came about. But, you know, one of the things back to being your own advocates, your own deputizing, 
And the hardest thing we find in, in trying to prepare a workforce is to teach people to listen. When you're, when you're dealing with someone you suspect may be suicidal, saying, oh, I know what you mean, I've been there myself, does not help. Simply acknowledge, repeat what they said to you to show you're listening and let them do all the talking. And it's amazing how difficult that message is to convey. We all, by nature, want to help. But um, I know you're running shy on time here, so I want to get hey, a couple of... all the time in the world for this work. Oh, right on. Okay. <laughs> and I can slow my, my talking down a bit. Um, one of the things that we see a lot, and I'm sure you get frustrated as well, some people don't know, we see a lot of, of warrior mentality statements made by senior leadership that is really stigma enhancing. They don't mean it that way. I mean, and you walk a really, really fine line because you are a warrior culture either way. But, you know, certain things that we see a lot of really drive stigma. We saw a Marine major, this mental health guy here recently, who said, uh, you know, if they're, if they're going to commit suicide, there's nothing we can do about it. Now, there's multiple things wrong in that statement. First, we don't say, you know, commit suicide anymore. But it's that almost fatalistic attitude that we can't help that okay, that really okay suicide. When you say we're, we can't do anything about it, you're tell, almost telling someone that it's okay. And so how do we create a message, a shared message across for the Navy, since that's who we're talking about right now, where all the leaders are, are really concentrating and, and focusing on non-stigmatizing language? Yeah. You know, the first thing I want to say is that, is that um, one of my patrons that I uh, frequently quote is St. Francis de Sales who says at the heart of strength is gentleness and at the heart of gentleness is strength. And it's a bit of yin and yang talk, but um, it is the strongest thing that you can do is to demonstrate your vulnerability to people. And, uh, and then, um, and when you are, and so uh, I, General Joe Votel, was previously the commander of U.S. Special Operations Command, and then subsequently the U.S. Central Command commander. And I had the very great honor of serving as his director of operations on a tour. And uh, he had a, um, you know, he had a, a, a really um, poignant example of a three-star, who of a two-star officer who on the eve of assuming three-star command um, took his own life in a, in a highly planned and choreographed method demonstrating that it was in no way um, a, a uh, uh, you know, an impulsive act, yes. And um, he talked about this notion of preservation of the force and the family in terms of, um, of, of, uh, of, being, of, of uh, being really honest with ourselves about, about admitting our own vulnerabilities and acknowledging our vulnerabilities. And we've got to model that behavior as senior leaders. And General Votel, related to every to to people uh some of the difficulties that he was having within his family the fact that he had sought counseling that that counseling had helped him overcome those problems and had made him a better warfighter you know a fitter human being between the ears and in the body ultimately and he modeled that behavior um for everyone and uh and so I think that those are the first steps as a senior leader is to understand that that yin and yang that goes into all of us is that we say to ourselves, I can't show weakness to anybody. And yet when a leader that you respect demonstrates vulnerability, admits to you, you know, confesses discusses the ways in which they needed help themselves 
externally, you're left with nothing but respect mm -hmm. for the courage, for the courage and the bravery of that person. And so I think it's very incumbent upon leaders to, um, uh, to, to have those discussions with people so that, so that we, so that we can do this. And, you know, it's a principle also of self-aid buddy care is, is before I apply a tourniquet to your wound, I've got to apply a tourniquet to my own wound so that I am tracking the blood pressure that's going to enable me to apply the tourniquet to your wound. And so uh, I think that, I think that's an approach. We do walk a, we do walk that, that line. I, I quote around the headquarters, I may be accused of separation of church and state problems by quoting Francis D. Sales, but he was a human being, he lived and he said this. And it's a great quote. At the heart of strength is gentleness and at the heart of gentleness is strength. strength. And, um, and uh, for me in my own dealings with people, I think demonstrating my own vulnerability first is such a huge trust builder with people. People will, you know, first build trust. And then when you build trust, and that can really only be do done in person, when you have built trust, then you can, you can get at the heart of the matters that are troubling people. You know, here you bring up another good point that I, even I, and I hate using myself, but this is a time for it. I, re, I had bad PTSD, PTS from when I was in, and, and I just ignored it for 30 some odd years. And it wasn't until we got really into, you know, fighting, helping other people that I finally decided to take my own on. And funny you mentioned cognitive processing. That's the program I went through. And, you know, I, I committed from day one that I was going to post every single day about how it was going. And you'd have died if you were if you followed us then, because the first four days where I hate this freaking shit, I want to quit. But I made a commitment to finish it. And what was amazing was by the end of it, I had so many people following it saying, my God, thank you for this. And then over the course of the next three months, we had over 100 people who said, hey, because of those posts, I went and got help. And yeah. you know, that was never part of it. That was never part of why I was doing it. I wanted to keep my commitment, but seeing that response, exactly what you just said, yeah, gentleness is strength, strength is gentle. I mean, that's just simple fact. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the rudiments of cognitive behavioral therapy is that your thoughts govern your emotions and your emotions govern your actions. Mm -hmm. And if you can, if you can um, gain, if you can gain control over your thoughts, uh, you can actually gain control over your emotions by stepping outside of yourself, attempting to take an objective look at the circumstances. And that helps you see that things are okay. And, uh, you know, one of the, I, when we talked in the lead up to this discussion, I was talking about the article in the Atlantic Monthly by, about Kevin Hines, who was the young man who, uh, jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And the moment his feet left the steel, he was, he, he was, he had a moment of complete clarity and perspective and a world of regret at, over the decision that he made overcame him as he made that fall over, I think it takes something like four seconds to fall to the water from the top of the Golden Gate Bridge. I talked to a friend of mine here who uh, is the 14th District Commander, the Coast Guard Admiral here, Admiral Mike Day, who on a previous assignment was assigned the Coast Guard station that uh, had the responsibility for, um, for rescue, more like recovery uh -huh. of the people who jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. And usually, the, the usually the people who are recovered from the water are alive for a few seconds uh, before they expire. But it is, it is, you know, overwhelmingly a fatal fall due to the internal injuries that they suffer. And he told me very poignantly that they express 
two sentiments before they die. And the first is they say, I'm sorry I did this. Uh, they regret having done it. And the other is an expression of hope, which is please help me. And, um, and uh, you know, we want people to have that clarity to be able to step outside of themselves before their feet leave the steel. And cognitive behavioral therapy, that ability to step out, gain perspective on your situation, recognize the hope that lies ahead, master your thoughts, which enables you to master your emotions, which helps you make more healthful actions that confer well being on you against our first primary duty, which is the dignity and well being of our fellow man. And which leads to what my job description is, which is the prompt and sustained combat operations incident to operations at sea. It's, you walk a you walk a line that I don't I don't even profess to imagine the intricacies involved. You know, one thing you said bringing up Kevin Hines that I want to make clear for anybody who's listening to this. Kevin Hines made an agreement with himself when he left his house that day to jump off the bridge. He knew he was going to do it, but his agreement was if just one person reaches out to me in any way and says, hey, what's wrong? I will not jump off that bridge. And he meant it with all of his heart. And he even had one instance where two police officers walk by and he's crying like a little, you know, like a baby and they just ignored him. And then another lady came up to him and saw him crying and asked if he take a picture. And, you know, that just showed him that nobody cares in, in his mind anyway, in that current state. But what the point I wanted to make is you never know when the simplest human interaction will save a life. You know, we had a kid on the carrier when we were out at sea who took his end of his life by jumping off the carrier in the middle of the ocean. Nobody knew he was gone till the next day. And same thing. He was having troubles. His wife had just left. He tried to talk to his buddy, but his buddy didn't have time. I pretty much guarantee that same buddy is hurting to this day because he didn't make time. So, you know, I just want to stress, if you think something's wrong, act on it. Trust yourself. Um, the, the next thing that we do deal with a lot and we get a lot of questions is how can we create a better and easier to navigate mental health process? I know, you know, right now we are dealing with more calls than we've ever done, dealt with before, and that's stretching resources. I know, for an example, now in the Army up in, uh, as I'm sure you are aware, in Alaska, they're going to a mandatory half-hour session every year. And is that something that's reasonable for the, for the Navy to do also is go more proactive? Our goal is to get left of crisis, because one thing we know is we're only going to save so many people in crisis. That's just, you know, a numbers factor. And it's not fatalistic, it's just, it is. And so if we can get left and stop them from getting to crisis, we've won our battle before it even starts, which we know the military loves that. So how do we do that? I mean, it, it is a tough situation to get mental health right now. We have a, we have a similar um you know, September is uh, traditionally suicide prevention month. And we have a September, we, we, you know, we call them conversations and then, and it confers general military training credit on it. But, uh, but I'll hearken back to one of my comments that this is but one arrow in the quiver among the dozens of tools that we've got to get to bear is that um, you know, if, if, I am, uh, if I am putting effect, effective fires onto an objective, I am firing from positions of defilade to encircle my enemy with lethal and effective fires. And this is the same approach that we must make to suicide prevention. Yes, a 30-minute session every year is a, is a, good, is a good investment. Uh, and it is one of many investments too. And so, and there are so many, uh, you know, we have a one love escalation workshop. There's a troop called theater of war who we bring in to do it, to, 
to it is a play that that is an uncomfortable play about suicide that is impactful we've got a uh, culture of excellence uh, discussions we have sprint teams that fly to the site of units that have had difficulty uh, to ensure that counseling is ready um, I think that uh, I think it's commander's business day by day uh, because you know one workshop a year is going to have a particular half-life it's going to mean a lot on day one on day 364 it's going to be a distant memory based on all of the other problems the army's been uh, you know I've watched and admired the army's similarly comprehensive approach to suicide prevention having served at United States Central Command which is really an army command with a little joint sprinkled on it <laughs> and so uh, uh, I, I have really long admired uh, the army's approach to this and modeled uh, for ourselves in the Navy, it's best practices in ourselves and sharing those conversations among the services about what's working and what's having less of an effect is really super important. Please, uh, I'm just, it's tongue in cheek when I'm talking about the CENTCOM. It's truly a joint organization, but there's a lot of soldiers there. You know, that's actually why we started these was to share what, what are you doing in the Navy that the Air Force can use and vice versa. So that, you know, I, I love you bringing that up. And, you know, one of the things that we had that was really unexpected, and I think you know General Minahan, right? Our last guest? I do, yeah. Yeah, Here I thought so. Well, you know, he was just really trying to show that stigma is okay and he made a mental health appointment. What he didn't realize was the value of that appointment because he, even when we were on our call, he really started talking about the appointment and it was great because we were able to hone in on some of the issues from his appointment. And one of the things that we have really been suggesting is that every officer make those appointments, but without the advantages of rank. You know, go through the whole process so you really understand. Like he was telling us that when he got there, he talked to, you know, an intake person, and then he had to sit on the computer and do a 45-minute questionnaire. And my first question to you, you know, if I'm in a mental health place, my goal is to get the hell out as soon as I can. I don't want to sit at a computer for 45 minutes. So, you know, our team came back and said, can you make that remotely available? Oh, great idea. So they're looking into that. You know, and I think that I don't know what the, the Navy's process is for mental health. Um, and I know it's got to be a little challenge, more challenging since you have a lot of smaller commands floating around. But, you know, do you think that would be a benefit is to have at least the commanders go through a full on mental health appointment? Yeah, well, um, uh, we have, you know, I'll tell you, I went through a full mental health appointment at, um, at, at right before I came into this command in March of last year. Um, and that was a part of my process uh, for healthcare for senior officers, because multiple senior officers over the last few years disproportionately really have taken their lives, including a very dear friend of mine. And, um, and that was one of the outcomes of that. It was in, and uh, Joe, Vo the, 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 uh, the example that Joe Votel cited with the army uh, was really kind of the first service that had the good idea about about doing that, and uh, I and and we have um, we have worked uh, to uh, to uh, put embedded mental health uh, providers on our larger ships right. that that serve folks, and then the and you know you know that the 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 uh, surface combatants such as destroyers are usually in communication with our larger ships, and we've got the ability to move personnel with alacrity from unit to unit within groups. So uh, yeah, I do think that there's tremendous value in it. I spent uh, an uncomfortable 90 minute session <laughs> with a Navy captain who asked me deep questions about myself and my ability to handle stress that forced me to acknowledge that I was under stress in my 
duty position. You know, mo most people think that, oh, you know, you're a three star or you're a four star and everything is given to you and you're driven everywhere and all that sort of thing. And you're not up every night at one o'clock in the morning gritting your teeth over what you've forgotten or what kind of e effects of the decisions that you've made are, um, are weighing on your conscience. And, uh, and I did find it to be um, very helpful and uh, I'd, recommend it for, I'd recommend it for everybody. And um, I think we're, we're getting better and better. I'm never satisfied, but we're getting better, better and better at looking after the mental health of our, uh, of our precious human beings that serve with us in the Navy. Yeah, we, we, we seem to be pretty much all, all of the guests that we're having are friends of yours, by the way. And General Garrett, he, he's just the best friend you ever had. He loves you to death. And, you know, he and I were talking a lot. And before his, I actually got the question that you just said, oh, what the hell does a four star have to be, you know, have PTS over? And, and it just floored me that that question, I said, well, you know, you were a sergeant, right? Yes. Did you have to send some of your men into combat? Yes. Did you lose them? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, did you get post-traumatic stress out of it? Yeah. So can you imagine that a thousand times as many people going into battle that you're responsible for? And it just, it, it annoyed me. So I understand 100% what you're saying. There, there, there is no doubt between four star, one star, as far as PTS, as far as any of that stressing out. So I want to make that clear this. to people. I'll tell you this too. I've had the great benefit of the leadership and friendship of General Michael X. Garrett, <laughs> who is on my Mount Rushmore of leaders. He is on Mount Rushmore. He's next to Votel. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I appreciate you saying that. It makes my day. Yeah, He's actually joining our team. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, when you see him, tell him I'm trying to send a kid to Xavier just to honor him. <laughs> <laughs> I love him to death. He's just a down-home guy. So, well, actually, all my questions are pretty much done. Do you have anything else, Admiral, that you want to sign off with? Any advice to your people? I'll sign off with something for you, Dave, and that is my profound gratitude for your mission of mercy, for your soul-saving work. And for all of the hours that you put in, if you prevent just one person from hurting yourself, hurting themselves, it will have been worth 10,000 hours of work. May God bless you and strengthen you in your mission, Dave. Thank you very much, Admiral. And you, please be safe out there. We know what's going on. So it has been an honor to have you, General. Admiral. <laughs> sorry, I'm still stuck on the General. So, okay. sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I thought you were a sailor, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the worst part I was. And I okay. screwed that one up. I got to say, you know, I never talked to him. Well, I did talk to one Admiral when he yelled at me one time, but that was the only interaction I ever had with an Admiral. So, this is like you talk about Mount. Mount Rushmore. This is Mount Olympus to me. This is way the hell up there. So, well, hopefully, I atoned for his mistake. <laughs> you did awesome. So, I appreciate it very much. And you have a great day, Admiral. Thank you. Kind of fun. Thank you. <laughs>